In the third part of my lecture, I'm going to tell you about three relatively unrelated schools of thought that sort of sit in the middle of all, all of this. And I just want to tell you about them because they were around at the time and, and they may, may help to sort of contextualise some of the other schools of thought that we've been looking at. So the three things we're looking at are natural philosophy, physiognomy and phrenology. You may have heard of at least one of these. So there's no clear path between philosophy and psychology as such. And these three schools of thought don't, don't make that path either. So natural philosophy was really, it's been around like many schools of philosophy for a long time. Um, and it's, it's really just philosophy as applied to the world of nature, the natural world. So that's what we might call physics, chemistry and biology today. And those topics were studied in philosophy in the ancient times and in medieval times, ready, renaissance, and uh, maybe a little bit today as well. The second school is physiognomy. And again, this has been around for a long time. And this is the idea or the belief that a person's character or personality can be read from just looking at their face, looking at the structure and movement of their face. And the third one is slightly more specific to modern times. And this is the belief in phrenology that a person's character can be read from their skull, from the bumps on their skull. So natural philosophy then, it's been around for a long time, but I'm just going to use um, the example from Isaac Newton. So between ancient philosophy and modern scientific methods, there was natural philosophy, or the philosophy of, of nature and natural things. Um, an example of this is, is Isaac Newton, as I said, and in the late 17th century, so 1687, he wrote a very important book called, in Latin, Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. I imagine that's not how it's pronounced. But this translates as Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. And Isaac Newton's well known for uh, inventing gravity and um, light and optics and other things, other sort of very physical subjects. But at the time, these subjects were under the umbrella of natural philosophy because it was, it was philosophical activity, uh, mathematical laws, um, but it was about nature rather than uh, sort of about the mind as such or about other more central philosophical topics. And in distinction to natural philosophy, um, you can think of natural history. So we still talk about natural history, and this refers to plants, animals, geology, and evolution. In a way, natural philosophy might be sort of the bio, uh, physics and chemistry, whereas natural history might be more like the sort of biology of modern day. So in distinction to more traditional philosophical schools, natural philosophy was a lot more scientific and mathematical than than, than current philosophies at the time. And, and we I think we would recognise that. We would recognise Isaac Newton as a modern scientist, even though he's writing, you know, 400 years ago, three, 400 years ago. So this image of natural philosophy is a picture of the cosmos and the stars and the galaxies and the constellations. So while philosophy, the traditional philosophy dealt with, while a lot of philosophy dealt with, say, metaphysics, which is um, the ultimate nature of reality beyond our perception, or ethics, which is you know how to lead the good life, or politics, how to how to arrange society and how to get the best out of society. Natural philosophy is much more concerned with the natural world as it is, so the cosmos, physics and chemistry, and then later biology. And just to see if we give you a flavour of what kind of topics were looked at. Um, Descartes, if you remember, he distinguished mind from matter. There were two kinds of stuff, mind stuff and physical stuff. And for Descartes, mind was the immaterial, non-deterministic, and you could call it supernatural. Whereas matter was material, deterministic and natural. And so while philosophy might deal with the mind, natural philosophy might deal with the matter. And so if you think about the development of natural philosophy into modern biological sciences, you can think of natural philosophy as sort of a materialist reaction to Descartes' mind-body dualism. 
So in so far as natural philosophy starts dealing with human beings as animals and having minds and brains, they're starting to bring the human mind into the study of ma material things. So this is an, an early form of modern materialism. This second topic is completely different, but it was around at the same time and it, it um, came into prominence in the 19th century quite a lot. The idea that someone's character and personality is reflected in their face is an ancient one, found in history, art, literature, philosophy and science. And this idea is called physiognomy. And the idea has been popular many times throughout history and in particular it's been popular again in the 19th century, the time that we're dealing with. And the idea that the appearance of your face reflects your character and personality and is influenced by your life experience, I think, has strong intuitive appeal. You know, we talk about people having a kind face or we talk about people's faces showing their hard work or their difficult experiences in their life. But the problem with physiognomy is a bit, it's, it's long been associated with a form of scientific racism or classism, you know, against the lower classes, maybe, or sexism. Uh, giving men and women different traits based on how they look, um, and maybe also speciesism. So you might think of different animals as having particular characters just because of the way they look. And these are all prejudices and biases that were really mingled up with with people's ideas about how the how the how people's experience and character is shown in their face. So I think we now realise that these sorts of judgments that human make about other people are, are really very biased. Uh, and it's thanks to psychology and the methods and, and principles of psychology that, that we're able to sort of tease these things apart. And so when thinking about physiognomy, there may, there may well be some small amount of scientific basis to it, but you've always got to be very careful about what is really, you know, what is really a matter of scientific concern and what is really just an excuse for people's biases. And so despite much criticism over the years, physiognomy is still sort of being used. And I found myself drawn into an argument last week on Twitter um, when I, I saw a, a study, an artificial intelligence study, looking at judging trustworthiness in faces. And I suggested that physiognomy was alive and well. And I think that's a debate we can have about artificial intelligence and face recognition and other forms of computerized assessment of people. And this approach to studying the face and psychology and character was it's actually um, used a lot by scientists in the 19th century. And I've highlighted here the work of Francis Galton, who produced this image at the top. And he was one of his one of the things he developed was a, a a method called composite portraits, where he'd take lots of images of, of different people in different different categories of people, for example, and then combine all the images together into one photograph. And so in this in this image, he's presenting 23 healthy people who all happen to be royal engineers from the army, 15 um, unhealthy people with tuberculosis, and then 12 criminal people, or criminals at the time. And I think you should probably be able, to be, be able to tell that these sorts of processes are extremely biased. So they they don't represent you know, how the mind and brain change the face. They, they represent a particular kind of person at a particular kind of time in a, in a particular society, in particular fashions, you know, for beards or for hairstyles. So you've got to be very careful about reading reading much about people's character from their faces. And yet, unfortunately, this is exactly the kind of thing that some artificial intelligence systems and algorithms have been accused of doing. And so the idea of physiognomy, although it has widely been discredited many times over many years, it still has real relevance today. We're going to come back to the work of Francis Galton in the next session when we talk about the relationship between man and animals and evolution and evolutionary psychology. The third of three topics that I want to mention today just in passing is that of phrenology and 
I'm pretty sure almost all of you will have seen something of phrenology in, in the popular press or in te psychology textbooks even. And perhaps some of the most widely known and reproduced images of psychology are in fact images of phrenological heads or busts like this one. It's the picture where they've divided up the skull into lots of mostly square segments and given them numbers and letters. And in case this is news to you, and it really shouldn't be after after a year or so in psychology, this is not the way the mind and the brain looks. It's not how it works. But this view of the mind and brain is divided up into lots of different mental faculties. It was, and it still is, an extremely popular idea. You can see it in the popular press all the time. You know, the brain area for this or the brain area for that. And this view of mind as localised in different parts of the brain is also not entirely wrong. So let's take a bit more of a look. So in the 1800s, there wasn't a science of psychology and there was, a neuroscience was getting started and getting developed and, and natural philosophy was really still the dominant approach to this sort of science. But Franz Joseph Gall in, 18, in the early 1800s came up with this phrenological system. He was a doctor and um, he would see patients and he would feel the bumps on their head and um, try and relate the, the bumps on their head that he felt to the characters of the people that he studied. And over the years, this grew into, a phrenological, into various phrenological schools. And the, the unfortunate truth is that despite much mockery and accusation of being a pseudoscience, there really is localization of functions in the brain and so Gaul may have been may may he may now be looked on as as sort of a as a pseudoscientist but he was a doctor and he was he was onto something when he suggested that that mental functions were localized in different parts of the brain for example Paul Broker described in 1863 Broker's area which is a brain area that has a special role in speech production and not long after, Wernicke in Germany described a similar brain area for speech understanding in 1874. So the scientific ideas behind phrenology are not necessarily wrong. I think the problem with phrenology, or at least our modern understanding of phrenology, was that it was greatly popularised and you know, taken on tour, almost like a circus sideshow, and it was commercialised and essentially ruined. Um, particularly by the Fowler brothers, whose most of the phrenological busts that you see are, they'll have Fowler on them. So phrenology then, although, again, looked on badly from our modern point of view, it's an early example of faculty psychology. And that's the idea that the mind is comprised of distinct mental components. And depending on your philosophical or phrenological school of thought, you might come up with different lists of these faculties and you can follow a link or and you can you know do a web, web search and find a whole load of faculties. And this, this image I'm showing you here um, shows several hundred faculties broken down into different kinds of faculties. And one list might be something like judgment, compassion, memory, attention, perception, consciousness. There's nothing really old about these concepts. We still use these categories to define areas of psychological research. So you're very likely to have modules in your psychology degree about memory or attention or perception or consciousness. In fact, indeed, there are, there are whole journals called memory, attention, perception, consciousness. And we have societies for perception and attention. You know, so these, these categories are still very much used in psychology. So the idea that phrenology or faculty psychology is pseudoscience is, really needs to be um, thought about very carefully. So I think the problem with phrenology is not that the faculties were wrong or that we don't have faculties, and it's not that there is no localization of brain function. Actually, the main problem is that if we use our brain functions a lot, the brain areas don't swell and they don't push the skull out <laughs> to form bumps on the skull.
So that's the end of this shorter introduction to three schools of thought that were around and that give you sort of a bit of a background to the scientific status in the 1800s. If you have any questions about these topics, please post them on the Q&A and we'll discuss them next week.